<laughs> well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you received some sustenance and some coffee as well. We are entering now into a session that I've really been looking forward to. I mentioned to you the panel just now that Whitehead's book, Aims of Education, is I think one of the most easily quotable books of Whitehead. And that's saying quite a lot since his, a lot of his books are quite quotable. So I'm happy to introduce Dr. Lynn Sargent de Young, who's had a career in progressive education that spans more than 40 years. She served as the founding head of East Bay Sierra School, which later merged with another school to form Prospect Sierra School, becoming one of the preeminent schools in the San Francisco Bay Area. Prior to work in independent schools, she spent 15 years in public education, administering federal funds to innovative programs, advocating for project learning as an alternative to tech textbooks, and pushing for integration in Massachusetts schools. Her BA is from the history, or in history from Harvard University, a master's in library science from Simmons College, and a PhD in higher education from Cornell. She's uh, the recent author of the excellent book, Starting with Whitehead, Raising Children to Thrive in Treacherous Times. I can recommend that book highly to all of you. And she is aptly uh, the right person, I'd say, to moderate this session then on process, philosophy, and education. So please help me welcome Dr. DeYoung. Thank you. First, I want to call everyone in from the foyer. Come all you fair and tender people. <laughs> We're down to an elite few here, so we need, we need all the listeners we can get. This third session on process, process philosophy in practice focuses on education. Now, nearly everyone in this conference is associated in some way with the question of how process philosophy informs or should inform educational practice. And each one of our speakers is engaged on a path not only of discovering their own role in this endeavor, but at the same time asking how they can help other teachers most effectively utilize their talents in interacting with their students. Our first speaker, Sinan van Stietenkorn, comes to us from Bad Heilbronn in southern Germany, where he is lead curator on nature at the Art <clears throat> Nature at the Art and Nature Foundation. As curator, he is responsible for developing innovative cultural and educational pro projects on topics of nature, philosophy, and art. In his regional collaboration, in this regard, he collaborates with national parks, environmental education institutes, and the Academy of Philosophical Education and Value Dialogue in Munich. And I believe they're having a conference this July. Aren't we? No, that's a different one? Munich School of Philosophy. Uh, I stand corrected. <laughs> For the last 14 years, he has worked as a trainer of teachers and developer of teacher teaching programs. In this work, he has been deeply influenced by process thinking and Eastern philosophies, as well as coyote teaching which is a modern form of inquiry learning based on Socratic questioning. A coyote teacher never gives direct answers and answers questions with other questions, inspiring students to dig deeper into lessons and search for embedded or connected lessons. A successful coyote teacher inspires students to learn at their own rate until the student no longer depends on the coyote teacher. Naturally, when a student is trained by a coyote teacher, the student becomes adept to the st that style of teaching and can, in turn, mentor more students in this method. A common saying among coyote teachers is, when raised by a coyote, one becomes a coyote. <laughs> Currently, Sunid is contributing essays on Whitehead's Rhythm of Education for a New German Compendium of the Life and Work of Alfred North Whitehead. Sinan's paper is entitled, 
overcoming the bifurcation of mind and education and daily life. The speedometer model of values and contrast in action. So let's speed up. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you so much for this kind introduction and your elaborations on um, coyote teaching. I, I really hope I can live up to the task and we're gonna have a lot of coyotes here in the audience later. Yeah, I'm gonna, okay, is it better? Okay. Yes. Well, when I sent Andrew my um, paper title, I did not expect him to open the conference with, <laughs> a presentation on a physiological bifurcation of the mind um, into the two hemispheres. And it really struck me, so I actually included it into my presentation as one of the examples. Um, but that's not the only example. Later, I'm going to refer to a lot of different talks that we heard over the last three days. And I'm really glad to be able to talk at this conference at this time of the conference. Um, I think the 50th anniversary of the Center for Process Studies is a very good moment to ask the question of whether our fascination for process relational thinking actually makes it to a visceral level. So did it really touch our deep subconscious presupp presuppositions that are rooted in our culture, language, and values? And for that sense, I brought a training device for non-dual practitioners, as I s hopefully um, see a lot of you here in the room, um, which I developed in discussion with my colleagues, uh, Marek Bartos and Christoph Rude, based on existing similar models, and we, or mostly I refined it during a, a decade of teaching teachers in open dialogue moderation. So this model helps to abstain from polarizing in thought, language, and social interaction, and it helps to maintain orientation and agency within the complexity of our daily experience. So I'm gonna go into three steps, like the, my presentation is gonna have three steps. Um, and I think of this model as uh, a Swiss army knife. Um, so a Swiss army knife is a really good tool to have with you at all times, and I encourage you to use this model to just, you know, doodling while you're on the telephone or in the same sense that we do awareness training while we wash our hands or brush our teeth. Um, but, of course, uh, a, a big tool shed, a workshop, needs more than just a Swiss army knife. So it's just a small contribution. This is where I work. Um, as you can see, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's also in the middle of everywhere and everything. <laughs> um, as a curator, my job is to orchestrate interdisciplinary exchange at the intersection of art, environmental science, culture, and application. So we work with farmers, foresters, gardeners, but also artists, researchers, and students. And it's a wonderful work, and process philosophy has been a guiding principle for me, uh, though it barely ever shows, um, really, to, like I'm, I'm not talking about process philosophy, I'm trying to, to live it. I'm trying to make it applicable and tangible. Let's dive into this term, bifurcation of the mind. Um, I think Whitehead states very clearly that one striking feature of the fragmentary continuum of our daily experience is a periodic rhythm. This rhythm usually happens between two poles, sometimes three, but I'm gonna focus on two. Um, we're currently fa facing a reality that is getting more and more polarized, politically, socially, but also in our communication culture and in the notions that we use to structure our thoughts. And I think this is like um, cl closely linked to these uh, quotes that I put on the slide. It says, uh, the creative process is rhythmic uh, in process and reality. In um, uh, the introductions of mathematics, he writes, the whole life of nature is dominated by the existence of periodic events. And in aims of, uh, aims of Education, he writes, life is essentially periodic, and we usually have two poles in this periodic structure. And uh, I thought that quite strikingly, the first blog entry of the tonight starting Common Good Film Festival is called Depolarizing Cinema for a Polarized World. And what I call the bifurcation of the mind is, in fact, a special case of a cultural or collective fallacy of misplaced concreteness 
it is when the experience of dualism turns into a mentality of duality. So you can see you've got this period, uh, this periodic rhythm, and if you cut it in the middle, both of the sides drop down and become extremes. That's what I call the bifurcation of the mind. Something between maybe yes and maybe no, and sometimes yes and sometimes no, becomes a definite yes and definite no, and it turns into, whoop, into a communication culture that uh, becomes more and more violent. Because when any two poles of this periodic system become not just conceptually distinguished, but experienced as separated qualities, it gives rise to a logic of the excluded middle, and thereby it allows populism, extremism, and reductionism to happen. So when you watch public television and any kind of public debate, you will probably notice uh, nowadays a very common communication habit of favoring one side while at the same time disregarding the other side as nonsensical or plain wrong. The winner in a debate is now not who wins over the other side with good arguments, but who actually pushes the opponent down into defeat. Marshall Rosenberg, uh, the founder of Nonviolent Communication, says, violence starts when we see the other as a member of a group or a type and not as a human being. Because our empathy with a fellow human being forbids violence because it will also hurt ourselves. But a foreigner, a member of the opposite sex, or the other political party, or just an animal, or just a tree. This distinction allows and justifies violent behavior. So let's jump into this speedometer model. Um, as you can see, I did not only, oh, how did you say sp speedometer? Speedometer. <laughs> speedometer, sorry, <laughs> I'm not a native speaker. Um, so I did not only include speed, but also sloth. Okay. Um, before, there's a disclaimer that I want to make. Um, I'm using a quote here from uh, the Rhythm of Education from, of Whitehead. Um, I'd really like to point out that what I'm about to tell is nothing new. No one in this room is going to be very surprised, and no one in this room is going to say, wow, I did not know that beforehand. Um, it is really an obvious truth, when you, especially when you deal with process philosophy. But at the same time, I'm not sure if we're all living it and if we're all practicing it enough. And that is why I chose this topic for my address. So the classical um, description of values um, is heavily influenced by um, Aristotle's um, teaching of the golden mean. And uh, here you can see that this is actually a linear model with two extremes. On the left side, there's a deficiency. On the right side, there's excess and then somehow a miracle appears, and in the middle we've got the virtue. Now, uh, the striking difference between this uh, original form um, and what I'm gonna tell you later is that, um, um, that it has on one side deficiency, on the other side excess, and I'm gonna explain what this means. So, Let's use an example that you all know, right? On, on, on the left side, there's cowardice. Uh, cowardice, is that a good pronunciation? So uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not strong enough to do this. I'm just going to run away. Mm -hmm. And on the other side is rashness or recklessness, which is just jumping into danger and endangering everyone around you. And in the middle, there's the virtue or the value of courage. Now, when you look at this closely, there's actually something missing because cowardice has a quality in it a very essential quality, and that's caution. So when we go to, oh, sorry, want to watch. When we go to the next slide, you can see that I added one element, and this element is a counter value to courage. So uh, when you have caution and you exceed in caution, you become a coward. When you have courage and you exceed in courage, you become reckless or rash. But at the same time, caution um, and courage have an interdependence that cannot really be thought without. Because caution without courage becomes cowardice, and courage without caution becomes rash um, rashness. So you see that these positive upper elements, they are interdependent, and they cannot be conceptualized without reference to the other. So, 
we're going to jump to the speedometer model now. And it is really just that. In German, there's a term called, uh, literally translated, it's donkey bridge. It's like a slightly silly explanation in or that's slightly silly in order for you to remember it better. And so this is a donkey bridge. Okay, it's a speedometer, just like the one that you know. And a speedometer has four different qualities. These four qualities are, it's stuck. Oh, yeah, it comes slowly. These four qualities are slow, fast, too slow, and you cannot see it because, the, but it says too fast. So no surprise there. Um, now, why, I'm gonna jump this so you can see it all at once. So you, as you can see, I explained that slow and fast uh, overlap because it's really dependent on the situation when something is slow and it's dependent on the situation when something is fast. Because it could be that for, for someone, the middle point feels slow and for the other person, the middle point feels fast. But then there are these red parts on the bottom and I want to go into these extremes. Uh, by the way, for the use of the model, it doesn't make any difference whether slow is left or right. Like you can s switch this, it really doesn't make any difference. But now to the extremes. There are a lot of valid and justified reasons to go very slow. For example, when you're parking and, or when you're next to a cliff. Or very fast, because you're in an ambulance, for example. But generally speaking, at the ends of the speedometer, the risk to lose track of the opposite value and therefore entering a bifurcation of the mind rises up. As an example, when you're being very self-conscious, it is easy to lose sight of caution and thereby become reckless. When you're very cautious, it's easy to lose sight of confidence and become timid. Likewise, precision without effectivity turns into a pointless loss in detail, like a pathological collector, for example, and effectivity without precision becomes destructive, like an elephant in the porcelain shop. Comfort without excitement will eventually lack zest of life, or as Whitehead would say, seed times, se times of degeneration, and excitement without comfort becomes terror. The opposites, therefore, must not be disjoined. As long as they are connected, even extremes can be good when carefully chosen. Herein lies a really interesting concept of evil, because evil, in that sense, is too much of one good with a substantial lack of the other opposing good. So let's go back to Aristotle's example here. And I, you see, I added some elements. Um, those already engulfed by the bifurcation of the mind will usually not perceive people from the other side of the speedometer in their qual quality. Instead, they will perceive them in the excessive quality. So the cautious will perceive the courageous as reckless, and the courageous will perceive the cautious as a coward. Um, they would, however, enter a completely different mode of interaction mutu and mutual appreciation when considering this with a speedometer model. The cowardice person actually excels at the quality caution and the rash person as, at courage. But they both might lack a trait of the other. So one could say, look, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really admiring how courageous you are. It's just too fast for me. It's a little bit too much. You know, it's a different thing than saying, don't be so rash. Okay, so it becomes more appreciative when you don't disjoin these, these two sides. So there's another line, which is uh, one that goes down, exaggerated criticism, and the other one is the positive development, because uh, when the cautious one really becomes a coward, he or she needs courage, needs to be encouraged. And when the reckless one really becomes rash and reckless, uh, then on the other hand, they can develop themselves by, exp um, by training in caution. So I'm going to show you now three slides with lists of polarities. And I'm not going to go into all of them, uh, but if you're interested, then please take a picture or write down the ones that you're interested in, because you can actually use them to practice yourself. Oh, so, oh, oh I forgot something important. Do you see up there it popped up something, which is valor, and um, that is actually when we successfully incorporate both qualities, a virtue arises. And that's an element of emergence that I'm going to talk about later, uh, but uh, you will already 
I guessed what it is. It's the integration of contrast. So um, let's <clears throat> look at these. I'm just going to put them all on the slide. This is from um, education, and I'm going to pick out one of them, the last one, affirmation or constructive criticism. I found it really interesting to talk with teachers and find out that their understanding of appreciation was only the left side, only affirmation, only acceptance. And they did not realize that appreciation also includes criticism, constructive criticism, being seen, some friction area. That is an essential element of appreciation. And I think a teacher needs to know that. Oh, five minutes? Okay. Now let's jump to politics and society. Um, especially in Germany, the oops, sorry. Especially in Germany, the avoidance of conflicts as a peace-loving country, and now facing the conflict in the Ukraine, has posed a really big challenge on politics. Um, but also, when you think about wealth and sustainable handling of resources. Uh, the European Union uses 23 times the agricultural area of Germany outside of the European Union to sustain its wealth. That is not sustainable at all. And we need to see how we can preserve wealth, but at the same time um, lower our consumption of resources. And I'm going to come to some examples from uh, Whitehead. Uh, I added the pages so you can look it up. These are all from aims of education or process and reality. And I'm gonna look uh, more into the last one, but I would like you to read, I'd like to read you the quote of the second last one, which I find beautiful. Um, and it might be interesting for um, uh, Merlin's study on fungi. Uh, he says, thus the problem for nature is the production of societies which are structured with a high complexity and which are at the same time unspecialized. In this way, intensity is mated with survival. And I find that to be a really, really nice polarity. But I also picked up uh, some more during the last three days. Timothy Murphy, for example, talked about, in about instrumental value and intrinsic value. John Becker talked about polyphilic pluralism and common elements in various religions. O'Neill van Horn talked about certainty and uncertainty. Andrew Schwartz uh, and also Megan Anderson talked about individual identity and social relations. And Andrew Doss talked about local autonomy and radical, radical connectivity. So I encourage all of the speakers, if you find one of these polarities in your talks, in your papers, try and make a speedometer out of it. Okay, let's go to the art of progress because I find that a beautiful example. Um, Whitehead writes, um, a co the contrast, um, another contrast is essentially, is equally essential for the understanding of ideals. The contrast between order as the condition for excellence and order as stifling the freshness of living. The paradox which wrecks so many promising theories of education is that the timing, that the training which produces skill is so very apt to stifle imaginative zest. The art of progress is to preserve order amid change and to preserve change amid order. And I'm gonna jump to the, it's stuck again. Okay, here. So when you put that into the speedometer, uh, then it becomes a really nice balance. And um, you can see that, uh, and, and then a few paragraphs later, uh, Whitehead writes, order is not sufficient. What is required is something much more complex. It is order, entering upon novelty, so that the math massiveness of order does not degenerate into mere repetition, and so that the novelty is always reflected upon a background of system. So you see that true novelty by integration of contrast needs to see both sides together, and then the many become one and are increased by one, so there's gonna be a new quality arising, and this new quality is not a compromise of the two sides. It, a compromise is the least common denominator. It is instead a synergy or, or a symbiosis. It's a win-win situation, and they can only be achieved according to certain situations on, and with a lot of creativity. Um, now I'm gonna, this is, yeah. Now you know what's coming, <laughs> Andrew, this is for you. Um, so I'm just gonna 
put this all in there because I wanted to show you that um, it's not just four points that you can put in there, but um, really as much as you want. Um, there's one missing, I don't know why. Oh, yeah. So I wouldn't put holism on the right side. Um, that's my critical response uh, to your paper. I think holism is the emergent quality, but maybe I've misunderstood what you said there. Um, I, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it later. And, uh, but what I find interesting here is that when you start arranging these terms, and you as native speakers might arrange these terms slightly different or might find different terms, what happens is that you actually put this duality or this polar rhythm into a spectrum and you start learning languages or notions that help you de describe the entire spectrum and gives you, give you more flexibility and more freedom to move on the spectrum. Because what I usually say is that you have um, a home zone, like an area where you say, this is where I'm really good at, and a learning zone on the other side, which is something that you should probably practice. Because if we think of the, the, the life as a, a po polar continuum that is just rocking forth and back, then the best survival strategy is to, to be able to move on the entire spectrum. So it means that if you see yourself on the bottom left or on the top left, then start practicing on the right, or if it's the other way around, this is your, um, your learning challenge. And I'm gonna, two minutes, perfect. I'm gonna jump to one last example, which is sustainability and consumption. And um, I find this example to be very important and we've used it a lot in, in our work on, on sustainability education because um, sustainable consumption is not just about um, using less, it's not just about uh, saving resources, it is also about finding the wealth in the scarcity and to see that, that um, scarcity itself can be a quality, like fasting, for example, is a really important quality, but it doesn't work if you only fast. So you need to see where are the elements and where can I, where can I find wealth and luxury and um, splurging in, in a way that it doesn't use any resources. And I'm thinking about spring and all the flowers and all the, you know, um, experiencing sunshine when we're coming out of a cold room. That is splurging, that is luxury, but it doesn't cost anything. So when we think about sustainable consumption, we need to really try to get the entire spectrum because if we tell our children, you need to live sustainable, that means you cannot enjoy life. You always, my father always used to say, it's organic, but it still tastes good, you know? And if, if, we, if we use that, then we're not gonna encourage our, the upcoming, uh, the upcoming um, generations to live sustainably. Okay, I'm gonna go to the last slide now, which is a summary, and I would really like you to um, see this as like a pocket tool. It's, it's something that you can do, you can doodle while you're on the train or when you, while you sit at home and you think, oh, I, I just discovered this duality uh, or this dualism, this, 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 um, this dual pair, and I'm gonna make a spectrum out of it. Um, and when you do that often, then something I'm inspired by our first speaker today with the wave. I think when you do that often, your mind and your actions become more flexible and you can actually serve the wave of polarity by freely navigating the pulse of life. Thank you very much for your attention.